Many of you already know us, so we are New, Bi New Bias Academy. We are a group of European bioimage analysts, and we have started organizing these webinars now or already nearly one a year ago. And um, there are around 25 webinars. We had collected many, many registrations, 14,000 registrations. And then you will find also videos on YouTube. All the webinars were recorded. And also there we collected um, over 40,000 views. And what you're here today is obviously nine. So we have two nine um, seminars, webinars. It's a small series of webinars, uh, one today and one exactly in one week. And um, this is, I'm very happy about this. I'm also using NIME a lot. And it's, uh, it's a very useful tool for analyzing your data and also analyzing images. But of course, um, we have the experts here to present you that. So we have today here um, Jan Eglinger, who is a bioimage analyst at, at FMI in Basel. And then we have uh, Stefan Helfrich, who is academic alliance manager with NIME, and he's located in Constance. And so they will be the, the speakers today and in one week. And then we have also, uh, we are a group of moderators, which will help you um, answering the questions. And this is uh, Franka Voigt from FMI also. This is Romain Gué from EPFL, Julian Colombelli from Barcelona, Rocco Dantfono from Crick and me. And um, there will be, uh, so if you ask your questions, there will be, you will see that uh, we will pass them on to the speakers. They will reply to that. So we really hope that this is a very interactive event. And with this, uh, I'm very looking forward to this, to the presentations of Jan and Stefan. So I stopped sharing and you are welcome to go. Thank you very much, Anna. So hopefully you should now see the first slide of my presentation. Um, really a warm welcome everyone. Thank you for joining and also for the organizers in the Rares Academy for, for having us, proposing the topic um, and inviting us and also sticking with us since it took quite some time to actually get this in our diaries. Um, so what we'll talk today about is NIME. Um, as Anna has already pointed out, um, and also very specifically about using NIME for image processing. Um, I will briefly switch over to the next slide. You have already seen our faces. Uh, Jan, I currently can't see you. Oh, yes, I can see your face. Wait for me, please. Yes. Hello, everybody. There you go. Um, Jan currently has been for a couple of years and still is a bioimage analyst at the FMI. Um, I actually put a second bullet point on this slide for me because you might think, who is this guy? What does he want to tell me about image processing um, when he is related to an academic program and all this management stuff? Um, so I've been doing this since 2017, but before that, um, I also did PhD in bioimage analysis and also worked as a bioimage analyst at the Bioimaging Center at the University of Constance. Um, so that's where my background comes from. And already during that time, I have used NIME for my um, image and data analysis. Um, if you are on Twitter active, um, there's at Jan underscore Eglinger and at Stelfrich. Um, feel free, reach out to us, um, mention us, whatever you like. Um, Jan, if you don't have anything urgent, immediate now, I would just go ahead. No, please go on. Thanks. Good. Um, so let's start with who or what is NIME actually, because that is always a bit mysterious when people start talking about NIME. Is it a software? Is it a company? Is it a cult? No one, no one really seems to know. Um, NIME in a nutshell, there's a couple of things. So NIME, first of all, is a company. We are, well, we're started out as a startup, as a spin-off from the University of Constance, where our CEO is um, a professor for information mining and bioinformatics. Um, but that was already 2006. So that was the first release of NIME. So we actually have been um, around for some time now. Um, we've grown to uh, a little over 
hundred employees these days and have offices all over the world. Our headquarter is in Zurich, Switzerland, but we have also big offices in Constance, Germany, Berlin, but also in Austin, Texas. And we're looking for people in Hungary these days as well, if you're interested. Um, so what, we, what do we do on a daily basis? We build software for um, data analysis. That's mostly two things. I'll come back to that in a second. The NIME analytics platform, um, that's on the one hand side, that's our open source solution. It is free. You can use it to build data analysis workflows. And then before that question pops up, because it usually pops up, how do we make our money? Um, there's a second product, the NIME server, that as the name suggests, acts as a central place. You can collaborate in teams together. You can execute your analysis centrally. I will not focus um, a lot on that today, but I thought I would mention it anyway. So what is NIME Analytics Platform? As the name suggests, it really is a platform um, for the entire, what we call data science lifecycle, really from um, getting data into the platform, data transformation, all that weird stuff that we spend a lot of our time on re renaming things, changing types of things and so on, um, to uh, really data analysis, and clustering, um, predictive modeling, um, but also interactive visualization, machine learning, artificial intelligence, really all that um, in a package. And the entire idea behind an analytics platform is that it's built around visual workflows. And I'll get back to that, what that means um, in a second. And the really nice thing about NIME is, is that it's, it's a generic platform um, that is extensible. And extensible in that case means um, you actually really can access data from a lot of different sources. And that's why we are here today. It's not only about text mining, but it's also about image processing. You can load your images in, you can do the image processing there, but you can actually bring it together and really join data from um, different sources. I don't know, do text mining together with network analysis and get some images into the mix. And this is really what NIME is great at integrating data from different integrating data, but also integrating different um, tools. So we do not try to reinvent the wheel every time. We have integrations with other great libraries out there. Deka, that some of you um, might know, for instance, Keras, um, H2O. You can actually run Python and R code um, from within NIME. And one prominent example here already, you could also execute your image chain macros on images in here, just to drop that here already. OK, what do I mean with? Um, visual workflows or visual programming, um, there's well, two and a half pieces to that. Um, so when we talk about workflows in NIME, let's first start and talk about nodes. Nodes perform tasks very much like the group by node here. Um, so this is really the atomic the atomic operation that is um, that is executed. Um, this task, the task receives um, input data at input ports and return the results at output ports. I'll come back to that um, in a second to introduce that a bit more. But the idea here now really is that you from the repository of nodes, really take the nodes and to connect the nodes, output ports to input ports to model data flow in your analysis and build workflows like we see here right at the center. So basically, for instance, connect the output port of an Excel reader to the input port of the, let's do this one, to the input port of the statistics node down here. And by that, we tell the statistics node, hey, do your statistics on the data that comes from the Excel reader that has previously been read into from, from an Excel file into NIME, and basically. And that really, you do one node after another, and um, you can build your workflows with that. Um, one node after another is only half of the story because there's actually a third layer and you can take a couple of components and you can modularize things. You can put them together into what we, you can encapsulate functionality into so-called components. And they, again, they look very much like the nodes at the top here, but inside of this component really runs a, a mini workflow and you can build those components yourself, modularize your own workflows. Um, but I mentioned starting from scratch and one node after another. It's not necessarily one native node after another. It could also be one component after another, reusing functionality um, that is available in form of this component provided by us or potentially also provided by the community. Um, so this really is 
well, it's an artificial workflow. It doesn't really have a lot of meaning, but it shows the entire breadth of the data science lifecycle that I mentioned before. So it's not only about images, although we'll talk about that a lot today. You can not only get data from, from Excel, but you can also um, connect to a variety of databases. You can connect to um, APIs and get your data from that, transform your data, um, do analysis as mentioned, classification here, decision tree, for instance, really build models um, based on your data, a visualization piece, and last but not least, you can write, for instance, write back into an Excel file your results, or you can also gener really generate reports in form of PDF or PowerPoint um, that contain the data or the results from your analysis, basically. So uh, that's that, now analytics platform. I won't bore you a lot more with um, slides, only two more, and then I'll jump over into um, a live demo, demo and show you actually um, how it looks like. So there's one thing that you'll notice in case you have seen that we put some um, instructions in the announcement of the webinar. Um, if you want to follow along, click along a bit and you've already went ahead, downloaded NIME, installed it. That is actually the very first thing that you'll see um, is on screen here now. You will be asked for a workspace um, to select. This workspace really is a folder or directory on your hard disk that will contain the workflows um, that you're working on. And it can also potentially um, store the data that you're working on. But we'll get back to that um, in a second. If you want to follow along, you can basically point it to any directory, although I would suggest create a new one and select it, sorry about that, and select it here in the, in the dialogue. And with that, let me jump over, stop the sharing and show you how NIME look, looks like. So we have actually, we've done a test before, but if you can't read anything, please also put that in the, in the Q and A section. I am able to zoom in if something really urgently um, comes up. So this is what we call the workbench of the NIME Analytics platform. This is what it will look like once you've started NIME the first time. We'll have a, um, a welcome screen here that helps you get started, gives you some tips um, and tricks. Not super important, but if you're starting out, it's actually, it's a nice gesture. We do have a couple of other views located around here in the, in the workbench. I will walk you through those quickly just to give you an idea. So here on the left top hand side, we do have the NIME Explorer. And that actually really is a view on the local workspace that I've mentioned before, really your folder with your workflows um, and potentially also your data. So there's a file and folder structure. You very like, like know that from, NIME, from the Windows Explorer, from the Finder and Mac OS um, and, so, and so on. So I have a folder for the new Bias Academy, for instance, in here. Um, we do have the node repository down here, which basically shows you all the nodes that are available for you to use in a workflow in your local um, installation. So very likely if you installed NIME for the first time, um, you've only installed a very minimal installation. So this, the nodes available in the node repository here change whenever you install new extensions. Um, they add new functionality, they add new nodes, then they will show up in the node repository down here. We have the console for, um, for error messages and so on. And over here, we actually have a description view that if we select a node in the node repository, for example, the Excel reader, it will really give you an overview. Of what does this node actually do? We'll talk about configurations options. I will show you that in a second. And if you scroll to the very bottom, it will also talk about output ports and input ports, which data is required, and what are the results, which um, data comes back. Um, so all that is quite abstract. I would suggest that I'll just go ahead and start a new workflow, create a new workflow, and right click on a folder here, say new NIME workflow, and we'll call that new bias demo, and click the finish here. And then you'll notice that the welcome screen actually disappears and we now have an empty canvas canvas here right at the center of our screen. This is actually um, the workflow editor where you put notes, where you build your analysis workflows. So the idea here really is a lot in NIME is about dragging and dropping. 
bear with me. It's actually quite nice. It's not meant negatively. Um, it's actually really, if I want to add a read data from, from a file, for instance, I would say here in the node repository, I would take a look at that. Okay, there's a category IO. I'm interested in reading data. I'll open the read category. And in here, for instance, I will find a CSV reader. I can take this CSV reader. I can first read, hey, what does it actually do over here in the description? Is that what I want? If yes, I can take it and drag and drop this CSV reader um, onto our workflow as a starting point um, where we for our workflow with the data that we that we want to read in. One thing that you'll immediately notice is that there down here, there actually is a, a warning sign if you hover over that, it says, please specify a file, which makes sense. I've just drag and drop the note. The CSV reader doesn't know anything, which CSV file should it read? If they, I don't know which um, column delimiter to use and all these configuration settings. So basically in the background, we see, and if we zoom in a bit, make that a bit clearer, you see that there's a traffic light that's currently on red. This basically means the note doesn't have doesn't know about all those parameters that it needs for processing. How can we provide those parameters? We can again talking drag and drop. We right click on the CSV reader. The context menu opens up, and in here we see the configuration um, dialog as the very first uh, the configure entry, the very first entry in the context menu. We can click that and. Give it a second, and then it will actually open up the, the configuration dialog. Um, they, once you've used them a little, you will see uh, um, reoccurring schemes here that parts of this configuration dialog, they are reused in other nodes. For instance, the one to select a file um, that is reused in um, a couple of other nodes, not yet all of them though. So that would be the very first thing that we'd have to point to say, okay, where do we want to read data from? from our local file system, the hard disk, we can click the browse button here, we can have some demo data lying around, we can come on, click on that and import some contractual data. I'll just use that as an example here. We can click open and it will automatically try to figure out what are the correct settings to configure this CSV reader, wherever possible we try to automatically um, pick some good default parameters. And you'll see a, um, a preview of the data down here. Um, okay, so once we have done that, we've basically provided all the information that the, that the node needs and say, okay. And you'll see that the traffic light jumped from red to yellow, meaning all the parameters are available, but the node hasn't been executed yet. That is, it, it hasn't done its operation yet. It hasn't read in the data. That actually is an additional step right click, open the context menu and say execute. Um, if we do that, you'll see there was very, very briefly visible a percentage um, at the traffic light jumps from yellow to green, meaning this node has been executed. Um, and how can we confirm that? We can actually, again, open up the um, context menu and you will find in the context menu at the very bottom where it says down here, file table for each and every output port um, where a node, so there can be multiple output ports as well. This just has one output port. For every output port, you will find an entry in the context menu here that actually allows you to click it, open up and get a preview, zoom in a bit and get a preview of the data. And um, so one point here is you can take a look at all the intermediate area data um, while building your workflow, you don't have to re-execute everything from the very beginning. You can really take a look at that at um, every node. And one thing that I want to point out in Nime, we usually work um, with tabular data. That is very much like, you know, from, from Excel, CSV files in general, we have rows, they have a unique identifier, row zero, row one, row two, and so on. We do have um, columns in here. Columns have a name and columns actually also have a type, integers, integer, integer, um, a string. We support double types, but we also support image types, for instance. But the thinking is we are thinking um, in, in tables, basically. So that is very, very first and important take home message. Um, 
if that is just right clicking and open opening up this um, output view um, is I mean it's a lot of clicks to just see the intermediate results. For that, there's actually an additional view down here that you should see automatically, the node monitor, which is great because you can actually it shows you um, by default for the very first output port. Um, it always shows you um, the the output data as well. So as you add multiple nodes to your workflow, as you build out your workflow, you can really click, 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 and take a look at the intermediate results. Um, so why don't we why don't we do that? Let's take a brief look at the at the data here and say we do have an account length here, and let's try to transform our data a bit and filter out the rows, all the rows that have an account length that let's say less than, than 100, for instance. How would we do that? It's nine, there's a note for that. Um, you actually don't know yet how it's called. Um, so you can either now browse the note repository, the hierarchical view of the note repository, or you can use the search functionality here. Um, there's a button actually next to it. I wasn't aware that this is a button until I don't know, I'd used now for a couple of years, honestly. Um, this enables a fuzzy search, which in the very beginning, if you don't know what nodes are called, it's actually um, quite nice. So we are interested in filtering out some data. I'll just type filter in here, and we'll actually see, ah, okay, so the very first node that shows up is a row filter. And now we can, the very manual approach is drag and dropping our node filter in here, our row filter in here really connecting the output port of the CSV reader by drag and dropping the output port to the input port of the row filter saying, okay, we want to filter data row wise from the, from the CSV reader. Again, red traffic light, right click context menu to the configuration dialog because we have to define what we actually want to filter out. So what do we want to do? We want to, let's, um, let's say we want to exclude rows by a specific value what do we actually want to filter for? We wanted to say, okay, we wanted to filter the a given account length. And now we have multiple options in here and we see, ah, there's a range checking that we can activate. We can define a lower and an, an upper bound in here and say, okay, we want to exclude all the rows with an upper bound of 100 um, with um, entries of less than 100 in the account length column. Say, okay, now it's not executed yet. You can right click and execute. And already down here in the node monitor, I'll open up the regular view. It's a bit easier to see there. You see that there were a couple of accounts with um, length and less than 100. Now they are not, not in here anymore. So we basically filtered out um, the data and really have modeled the data flow by connecting um, input ports. Uh, sorry, output ports to input ports of um, of other nodes. Um, two things that I want to point out here. Um, sometimes it's when you start out, it's very tough to know how to continue. Actually, what is what is the next node that I want to do? But very often you'll see, and also that's not only specific to Nime, but also I don't know if you use ImageJ for instance or Cell Profiler, you do very similar things. Um, very often when you do your analysis, basically. The good thing about that is we do have a workflow coach that you see here on the, on the left-hand side that actually suggests you based on input from the, from the community, what would be the next row, uh, sorry, the next node? What does the community most often, um, which node does it put after a row filter? So very often that will be in 12%, that is a group by node that if we have the time, we'll come back to that um, later today. But the workflow coach, really, the idea is that you, depending on what you select, it's context sensitive, um, that it actually shows you suggestions, how you could continue, how people very often continue. And like 10% is actually, well, not maybe not that significant, but there are cases where people, um, in 80% of the cases, they just use one node because that's what you, what you very often do. And that's actually also really helpful um, as you learn about Naim, um, but as you also don't know what um, what nodes are called yet. Um, good. Yeah, I think there's um, the second thing that I want to mention. Actually, if you find all that a bit cumbersome, it's very educational today. So I'm showing you the 
all the clicks, mentioning all the clicks um, explicitly. Um, if you're keen, there's shortcuts for a lot of things, um, as in keyboard shortcuts, but there's also small shortcuts that make your life um, a little easier. For instance, you don't have to create a CSV reader manually, but you can actually, um, from the NIME Explorer, you can actually, uh, um, I mentioned before that it can also contain data. We have some, some data in here to actually take that uh, and drag and drop that, um, drag and drop it in here and it will automatically create a correct CSV reader node up here. And it will also auto configure the node to the, to the X10 possible. And this also doesn't mean that you have to import all your data into your local workspace. It also means that, oh, let's see, second screen, let's hope this works. I do have a CSV file here that I drag and drop from my finder that might be a Windows Explorer, for instance. I can take that and really drag and drop that in here. It points to the directory and the file on your hard disk and it automatically created the node, which makes things a little easier um, to get started. Good. Um, I think for now I should have covered the, the very basics. I've talked about nodes, um, that nodes can be in different states as indicated by the traffic light below each node. Um, usually they're not configured when you add them to a workflow, you go in, right click configure um, to set the parameters, jumps to yellow and only when you execute um, a node you can um, jump to green and only then um, is the data at the output port um, available as well. You do, you drag and drop um, from output ports to input ports to model the data flow in the workflow. And also implicitly, that's actually quite nice and I should mention that implicitly by modeling the data flow, you're also modeling dependencies between operations. That is, you don't have to go in and as your workflow grows bigger and Jan will show that in a second, um, that you add more and more nodes. You don't have to specifically execute them one by one, but you can actually reset a node to its configuration state. I'm warned that I really want to do that. Yes, I want to do that. And you'll see now if we set this CSV reader node, it has automatically reset the, the row filter node here. So there is a dependency. This CSV reader nodes, uh, CSV reader node knows all the downstream, all the downstream nodes that we are basically are dependent on its output data. What that also means on the other hand is, if I want to just execute this row filter here, right click execute, really executes all the nodes upstream until it has, has reached a point where the data that is required um, is available. So you can really, um, at the very end of your workflow, very one of the last nodes in your workflow, you can try to execute that and it will execute all the, all the previous nodes. Um, good, let me briefly jump back to the PowerPoint presentation. That Maybe if I is... can interrupt quickly, sorry. Yes. Um, there was just a, a question coming in, uh, how to do about um, reading multiple CSV files, if you need like multiple CSV reader nodes or how you can do that. I think we can quickly answer this at least theoretically. Yeah. So theoretically and practically, that means um, you see up here the setting where it says uh, I can switch the mode of such a reader from file to files and folder. And then I actually don't point it to a file anymore, but the filter options show up here and here I can define which, um, which files I actually want to read, filter by file extension, by some uh, regular expression or wild expression that is matched to, to the file name basically. And then it reads in all the CSV files Practically beware, um, your CSV files should have the same structure as in ideally the, um, the same columns, then this works perfectly well. Um, no problem here at all. If there's changes in, in columns, it might become a little more tricky and then you might have to revert to multiple um, CSV readers, which is also possible. And maybe just to add to that, there's also the um, the advanced option of using loops um, to re-execute the same CSV reader in, with different parameters again and again, for example. Yes, okay. jumping ahead, <laughs> yeah. very far, far away. <laughs> exactly, but yes, that's true. Thank you, Jan. 
Um, good. Let's briefly take a look. Um, so you'll receive um, all the slides. I have a couple of backup slides in here if you're curious, explaining all the things that I've just um, shown to your life, basically, um, about the node repository, how to insert and connect nodes, which statuses a node can be in configuration, um, and so on. There is one thing that I briefly wanted to mention, and I will actually jump to the presentation mode here, is um, as you're starting out with NIME, I mean, enable the fuzzy search in the node repository, one suggestion. Um, but the great thing about NIME and the community also is that um, you don't, very often you don't have to start from scratch. That is, there's a lot of examples that you can build on. Um, how can you access those? There is the NIME hub at hub.nime.com, um, which really is a search engine for workflow examples for components that you can reuse, um, modularized sub, uh, sub workflows basically in form of components. Um, you can also learn about nodes and it's pretty interactive. You can drag and drop things from the browser into the analytics platform. If you want to add a node, you can import workflows by just copying a URL and pasting it into, um, into your nine. So you really you barely um, have to start from, from scratch and really take a look at the hub uh, and look if someone has actually had a um, similar problem or it's just an example workflow around. Good. Um, there's no immediate questions. I will briefly zoom out a bit, um, take a look at the higher level again. What you see now is the NAM Analytics platform. And we don't only build functionality for um, NIME ourselves as in NIME. It is um, open source and we're really open by nature. Um, well, not really by nature, but you get the point. Um, the idea is that people really can contribute, they can extend the functionality um, of NIME, and that might be us extending the platform ourselves. Um, but down here, you also see that there are community extension, we also have a network of partners, and that can also contribute and do contribute extensions, adding um, functionality, and let's spare out the, the NIME server part here. I wanted to use this as a segue because I mentioned before that you can also do image processing with NIME and NIME image processing actually is such a community extension that is contributed by, um, the, by the community. So what does the NIME image processing extension actually do? It adds um, processing and analysis capabilities to NIME um, itself. Again, it's just a generic platform basically. And the capabilities come in form of nodes, like I mean, show the CSV reader, for instance, but there's also an image reader that's added with the image processing extension. But it also adds support for um, different columns types. I've shown previously integers, number, uh, integers, strings, and so on. But there's also support for images, labeling images, um, and so on. And what that in the end actually means is that you can really build end-to-end -end pipelines. You're going in with an image, you point NIME at your image files and maybe some experimental metadata in a CSV file. You do your image processing in NIME, build your pipeline down here. You extract some features. I know it's very hard to see, but Jan will show a good example of that, walk you through it. And then you can, again, use regular or generic NIME functionality, building a model from the data that you've extracted from image or, um, I don't know, doing an interactive visualization because it doesn't really matter to the visualization where the data come from. It doesn't really matter if it comes from images or um, CSV files. And the great thing about that really is you build a workflow once and ideally if your images are structured the same, same number of channels and so on, you point it at new images, you rerun the pipeline and you just get out um, the, the results. So you actually get batch processing almost for free. Not entirely for free, but almost for free. Um, so now image processing is, again, we're really standing on the shoulders of giants here, I already mentioned um, ImageJ, really a lot um, by image processing. We have been an active member of the, of the community. We're using um, functionality from SciJava, for instance, from Encrypt2, from um, ImageJ, ImageJ2, um, and so on. So now I'm always is a lot about integration and also reusing functionality, but then also contributing back if we are um, using things. So behind the scenes, this is what it looks like. Um, our image data are represented um, as um, Encrypt2 data structures, as 
the same as in image J2, for instance, um, a lot of the processing and algorithms uses um, the image J ops framework, um, uh, but we also add a couple of um, new algorithms in NIME. And on top of that, there's the image processing, basically the nodes um, calling out to the, to the functionality. So we haven't reinvented the wheel but we're also trying to reuse functionality, which has some amazing perks and benefits that we'll, I don't know, maybe hear about today, but maybe also um, hear about next week. And with that, if there are currently no super urgent question, I would actually like to hand over to Jan. Um, don't despair, you can't screen share just yet because I have to stop first. And then you're actually allowed to share your screen and talk about an example. Yes, thank you, Stefan. Let me share okay. the screen. One second. All right. So also thanks from my side to all the organizers for inviting us here and uh, for setting the whole meeting up. So um, yeah, I, as promised, I would like to walk you through a small example case with an actual, an actual image processing problem. So uh, we selected for you today uh, an image case of a multi-channel fluorescent image uh, where our task is basically to segment the nuclei and then for each nucleus, we have a, a DAPI staining in the fourth channel here for each nucleus that we uh, segment, we would like to um, to only measure those cells that are positive for a given marker in our first channel. And within these cells that are positive for this marker, uh, in the end, we would like to count foci in yet another channel in this uh, red foci channel here. So we'll just start with a very easy step of segmentation and that probably covers the, the rest of the remaining time for today. And uh, we also prepared a little assignment on a similar data set for you We'll talk about that later in case you want to uh, hands on to try, try it yourself until next week. Uh, and of course, as uh, Stefan already mentioned, batch processing uh, comes almost for free in NIMES. So basically we also want to do this segmentation not only on a single image, but of course on multiple images at the same time and then integrate the data from these images. So um, before I go to the to the demo, well, I'll also have the, uh, in the, in the slides, you will have the summaries for the new node descriptions. So uh, similar to the CSV reader, we also have image reader nodes in NIME. And let me just switch to my NIME desktop, my NIME analytics platform right away. Um, I will also just um, right click and create a new NIME workflow here. I'll call it new BS. Um, image segmentation. And if you look at the node repository down here, I can make it a little bit larger. Um, I can look directly for an image reader and you see that there's multiple image reader flavors available here. So that's one way to get the reader in. Of course, uh, the same with CSV files, we can also do with any images that are um, compatible with bio formats or that you can open in Fiji and ImageJ. We basically can use the same, read all the same formats because we are relying on the same li underlying library, the CIFIO and bio formats. So if we open, uh, for example, an LSM file here, I can just take that file, drag it onto my workflow, and then I get such an image reader here. And this image reader is already pre-configured to read exactly that image file. Oh, sorry, I, it opens also. I can just cancel it as it is and right click and choose either execute or execute and open views. If I execute this, it will basically now perform the image reading which can take a long time if it's a large image and also if it's multiple images, of course, but it's uh, reasonable, well, depending on the image size, of course. And now um, there, so as usual for any node with an output port, 
you will have the output down here at the uh, images entry. But in addition to that, you will also have a second, a specialized viewer called the image viewer that allows you to actually watch uh, or yeah, look at, at multi-channel images. So I'll just take this image viewer. And um, unfortunately, with 16-bit images, that's a bit of an annoying uh, issue with, with the overview here. Uh, you often see only black squares. That's one of the annoying things that in the community project NIME image processing, uh, no one has taken care of yet. But um, you can just click into any of this, these thumbnails. For 8-bit uh, images, they are usually the preview works, works nice. But for 16 images, sometimes you see only black. And now when you click on this thumbnail, you see a preview and you see the dimensionality, dimensionalities here uh, listed. We have an X and Y dimension. So that's basically just a 2D image, but it contains multiple channels. We have channel one. Well, I can scroll through the channels. So this one, the first one is the one with our marker that can be uh, well, positive or rather negative in the cells. And then we have the second channel, sorry. The second channel has these foci that we want to quantify finally. The third channel we ignore for our example today. And the fourth channel is uh, the one that we use for segmenting the nuclei. Also, you can use in this uh, image viewer, you can use expand table view to browse through the tables. We will see that later when we have multiple images. So now, as I said, we don't want to only work on a single image. We right away want to do uh, batch processing. Of course, now I dragged it from, from my finder window. I can also drag it if, in case I have the data inside my workspace directory, I can also drag the LSM file from here and it would open this image reader. And now let's delete all of these. I right click and delete. Of course, you can also use the delete key for that. And I confirm. Um, I just wanted to show you an, yet another way of reading in the images, which is this image reader table. If you drag this one in, uh, you see that it, it has an input port and an output port. And that is why, uh, because the image reader doesn't take a given image as configuration, but it reads the file paths to open from the from the input port. So that's a file names port in here. And then it will perform the image reading and give you the images that are being read. So in order for to have a uh, suitable input for this image reader, we need to somehow list the files in a, in a folder. So I'll just search for files and voila, you have the list files folders node. I hope you can more or less see it. And I'll drag this one just in front here. And I can right click and configure or that's the first shortcut, just double clicking on this one will always open the configure dialog. Uh, that's usually what I do. And now we can choose to e either give it a, a full file path in the local file system, or if you have it in the workspace, you can also have a relative to the current workflow, let's say. So then I would just create a path that is relative to the location where I've sa saved my workflow. And now let me browse this. Um, it starts up in the workflow folder. I go to the data file and uh, on Mac, I actually have to check the folder and then say choose. And it would just give me the path relative to the, to the workflow. So that just one directory up and data. Now it also tells me immediately that in this folder, I have three files. I can also filter, for example, for the file extension. So you have these filter options here. Uh, you could, if you have more than uh, just the images in the folder or some other metadata files, you can filter them for them. And then finally you click okay. It switches to the yellow light as just Stefan uh, explained already. And now, if I right click execute, I can check here in, um, oh no, it's not in the node monitor here. This one doesn't have them. If I right click and go to the last entry, I have the file paths here. 
So now this uh, column type is rather new. It was, I think, introduced with NIM4. Um, this is a special path type, um, which is net, not yet supported by the image processing uh, nodes. So we basically have to just convert this path to a normal uh, text string. So that's another uh, node that I still need now. On the list files node, I would have a path. And there it is, path to string. That's what I want to have. I take the opportunity to introduce another small uh, shortcut. Uh, when you have a node selected here, uh, that is basically active, it has this bounding box around it, then it's sufficient to just double click on an entry in the node repository and it will place this the next node after this active node and immediately connect it. So it saves you a few clicks, but, uh, saves you dragging uh, the node and then connecting this, this line. So the path to string node, um, it says it's not yet configured, but it auto guesses the configuration. So usually I don't even need to, um, to do anything in the configuration. And I can connect it to the image reader table. And now I can configure this image reader table. Did I double click? Let me right click and configure. And now it reads from the only available column named location. I can essentially let it be like this. In the other tabs, you can have the option to also set uh, subsets only if you only want to read, for example, uh, several frames from a time-lapse image acquisition or just a, a subset of a stack. But for now, we want to read the entire uh, image for all the lines. And now I will execute and then view the image viewer. Now you see that we actually read in three images represented in three rows and uh, a single column of type image. And I click on any of those ones. If I just selected the image viewer and I can uh, see here um, the, the image that I saw before already, the first one, scroll through the channels. And if you now Look at the table. Of course, it's nice to have a, a larger screen here, but I um, voluntarily chose the small screen so that you can at least read the text. Um, if I click on any of the other columns, I can just browse through, through the images here and select any of these images and look at all the channels. So that's the first step to get all the data in. And now the well, what we want to do now is segmenting just the channel number four. So what we need to do first, uh, because we have a multi-channel image and we only want to work on, on one channel, is we basically need to split the channels. That's what you also would do in, in image J, for example, you would just split, uh, split channels. So we have similar here, we have a splitter and you have to scroll down to get the community nodes, image processing, where we have image and splitter. So that's what I want to use now. I can again double click and it will immediately add it to the last active node. And now this one, you can also read it in the, uh, in the node description on the right side. Uh, it will allow us to, to split on any dimension of the image. If I double click for the configuration dialog. You have uh, a few options to choose. So you can choose, uh, if you, in case you have multiple image columns, you can choose which column to work on. Uh, you will always see a column creation mode here where you can choose whether you want to create a new output table or whether you want to actually just append a new column or replace the current column you're working on. So that can be uh, helpful from time to time. And uh, in the dimension selection, uh, in, in the case of the splitter, you have to just remember uh, that it's um, that you have to choose the dimensions that you want to keep together. So basically, if I want to keep X and Y and have a new entry for each channel, I just le uh, leave the channel unchecked and only X and Y, which guarantees that I will get images that only have these two dimensions in the output. If I click OK, run and 
well, I will right away click execute and open views now to speed up a little bit. Now you will see that out of the one image per uh, row, I got four images with a bit of a cryptic title in here. Um, that's due to the underlying uh, library imglib2 that basically we have the, if you look, uh, we have the channel index indices here, zero, one, two, and three. And I can click on any of those images and you see that now they have their only XY images and don't have any active slider for, for the channel, for example, because they're just single channel images. All right. Um, now we want to go ahead segmenting our fourth channel. Uh, there's multiple ways of doing this. Of course, we can just in the in this table select the, the column of interest. Now, uh, just for illustration purposes, I would also like to, um, to, to show you how to filter out a specific column that we don't need anymore. I uh, quickly mentioned that we don't require our third channel. So I will just look for a column filter in this case. If you search for filter, you'll also find that. And um, well, if I double click again, it will add it to my workflow. And if I double click on that node, I can choose uh, which, uh, what configuration I want to have. So in here, I can choose uh, the third of the four channels and just um, move it to the left panel. In the red box here, you have the columns that will be excluded from the output. And in the green, you will have uh, the included columns. So if I leave it just like that and execute this node, then you will see in the output, we are, we are left with only three columns. And now these, uh, these column titles, if I right click again here, uh, they're, they're still rather cryptic. So I would like to get meaningful names for our variables of the three columns. So basically the first channel I said was the, the marker channel. The second one is are the foci of interest and the now third column, which was the fourth channel would be uh, the, the DAPI channel for the nuclei. So I would also like to rename, let's see. If I find this, there's a column rename right here. So double clicking this, again, double clicking on the, or right clicking configure on the column rename gives me another configuration dialog. And here I have the, the existing column titles. I can double click on one of them, say change, and I want to say a marker. I do so for the other two as well. I want to change this to the foci channel and again, change the last one to the nuclei, for example. Okay, so that's just a bit of uh, housekeeping to illustrate what you can do to make your, your analysis more, well, to, 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 to make it more meaningful in case uh, you, you want to read your workflow in a few months from now, so you know what what was intended here. Now let's go to the actual segmentation. So for the beginning, I would like to just use a, a threshold, a simple global threshold for the intensities, as I would also do, for example, in Fiji, when I just uh, threshold the image. We have, of course have threshold here as well. Uh, in the image processing, there's actually multiple thresholding um, nodes, Local threshold is also a, a local pixel neighborhood, uh, whereas global threshold is the, the default threshold that you would also have in image J. Uh, so globally on the entire image, that's why I want to use. And double clicking on here, we will have an option dialog here. Maybe I quickly jump uh, to, uh, to the presentation again. So this is what we covered with the output views and splitter. Um, <clears throat> so this, this global thresholding node, it creates a binary mask. So basically it, it binarizes the image into white and black or into true and false pixels. 
just by applying the, the threshold value that you can either define manually or uh, with uh, any of the automated algorithms that you might be familiar from ImageJ as well. And uh, the dimension selection here is basically what uh, is what any automatic calc uh, calculated threshold is calculated on. So if you if I choose an Otsu or Yen or whatever threshold, it would be um, selected based on these dimensions. So if you have a multi uh, multi channel and multi time point time lapse image, uh, and you select the channels and times as well, it would try to guess the threshold on the entire uh, hyperstack, basically. Um, so, so we can do that and I can choose from several uh, algorithms for the, for the thresholding methods. Uh, you might be familiar for many of them already. Uh, in this case, I'll try just the Otsu method, for example. And I will say OK and execute and open views. And now I forgot something very important. I'm sorry for that. Um, as you see here, now it applied the threshold to all three columns because I didn't tell it anything different. So basically, I, um, it, it defaulted to, to using all three columns as input. If I configure this node again, you see that there's a second tab here where you can actually se select the columns to work on. And I can remove all and just say, double click on the nuclei or use these, uh, these arrows to go forth and back. And say, I only want to segment the, the nuclei here. If I click OK, it, it gives a warning that you reset the node. So basically, if you remember, I had just executed the node. So in case you lose any anything that was computed beforehand, uh, so it warns you that you actually will lose these uh, first execution results. So it switches back to the yellow light and you have to re-execute it. And now it should work with only one. And because I left it on the new table mode, so it just uh, creates a new table with only the results. And um, we'll show, show you still in a, in a minute um, how to join these results together with the original input data for, that we had. OK, so now if you see here, that's of course far from a perfect segmentation. You see uh, these little dots and so on and so forth. So it's very pixelated. I guess most of you will immediately suggest to do some smoothening before doing the threshold. So of course, we can just apply now a Gaussian filter. Um, I look for Gaussian. And if you just scroll down to the image processing, you have uh, this one, Gaussian convolution. So that's basically the, the Gauss filter. And now uh, another nice functionality of NIME uh, is that you can just drag a node onto an existing connection and it will introduce this node in between the two connected nodes. So if I drop it here, it's of course still asks for confirmation. You are altering the existing connection between two nodes. So are you sure that you want to do this? Of course we are sure. And also the, the previous, the later node here, it was executed already, so it will be reset. I have to confirm this as well. If you don't like these messages, you can of course um, select to never be been shown them uh, to them again. So now we have introduced the Gaussian convolution. If I look at the configure node here, this node uh, allows you to select uh, several sigmas here for each selected dimension. So for example, for X and Y, we could actually, if you want, we can choose two different um, sigma radii for the, for the Gaussian convolution, or I can just put a, a single number and this single number will be applied on all the dimensions here. If I apply, if I have 3D data, uh, that's another very nice thing in my opinion about uh, NIME that it really uh, works well with uh, 2D and 3D with almost no changes. So I could also select X, Y, Z here. It would not care if it doesn't have Z in my images currently, but if I switch at some point to 3D data, it would also do the Gaussian convolution on 3D. Uh, and of course, if you have anisotropic data, 
you could also do something like 552 to account for, for a different set scaling, for example. But for now, let's leave it to x, y, and uh, convolution of five. And of course, I again missed that I wanted to only select part of our columns, just the nucleus column. And let's have a look at the result. So this one is just the blurred version of the of the nuclei. Now, oh, another point here. Uh, if you are uh, short on, on screen estate here, we can double click on the tab and it, you can temporarily switch to a full screen mode of that tab to have an overview of the entire workflow. If you double click again here, uh, you're back to the original layout of the, of the panels. Okay, now we re-execute the global thresholder and um, we don't have to execute every node one by one, of course, as Stefan mentioned, I can just go to the last node, execute it, and all the dependent nodes will be executed first. So now this looks already a little bit better. I have at least smooth nuclei, all good. I have a binary, binary image. Now to actually get a segmentation, we would like to have uh, something like labels for every unique cell in image J, you would do that with analyzed particles, for example, to get a measurement for every, for, for every cell. Uh, in other uh, frameworks, such as uh, MATLAB and Python, this is usually called com connected component analysis. And that's what I call it, what it's called here as well. So connected component analysis down here in the image processing tab. So we can run this one on the binary image. I will double click to add it to the workflow and double click to open the configuration dialog. Here, I actually can leave everything with the default settings. Uh, there's options to, uh, to switch between the four or eight connectivity in uh, two dimensions and respective uh, the, on the other dimensions if you select more here. And of course, you can you always have this recurring column selection dialog, which I don't need to change because we only have the nuclei anymore here. So I click OK and execute and open views. And now you will see nice colorful segmentation images. And if I click on these ones, so you see they have multiple colors. And in the, um, in, in the um, table view, you might notice that they have a specific column type called segmentation, SEG here. So that's a specific type, a labeling type um, that is uh, brought in by the imglib2 library. And um, it, it's a very, actually a very flexible image segmentation type. Uh, if, you, if you look at the well, maybe I can point to it. I don't have it here. No, no. So <clears throat> if you look at this part of the screen here where it says value equals, uh, when, I, when you're in the background, it's an empty label. And when you are um, hovering over any of the cells, you get the actual number of this label. And the, the um, colors are just randomized. So basically you can have here, in the label options. If you expand this here, you can uh, randomize the label colors into different colors in case you need to see some more contrast between some very similar colored cells. So just uh, for a visualization. Okay, let's quickly switch to the- Jan, can I briefly interrupt you yes. while you're switching over? Sure, um, yes. Jan Please. had actually an interesting question. He asks about duplication of images that in image J you always have to create a duplicate if you want to keep the the original image around do we have to do this in NIME as well or how does it work actually that's a good point so um, usually by default um, if you have this uh, option uh, of column creation type new table it will actually do this duplication in the most uh, most cases 
So for example, yeah, in, in this case, every node would duplicate the, the image or just compute the result without changing the, the input image. Uh, that's important when you work with uh, very large data or yeah, large images and have a workflow with uh, a lot of nodes chained after each other. Because once you want to, for example, save the workflow in an executed state with all the data, it can lead to, to quite long saving times. So you have to be aware of this. Um, on the other hand, you can also change uh, here replace, uh, which would, however, it would replace the column in the in the output table, but not change anything on the other nodes. For example, if you branch in the workflow, or if you're um, so anything upstream of the workflow, would not be changed. So, so there's no chance uh, to mess anything up by by, by changing the image by mistake. Uh, maybe Stefan, you want to add anything? Um, no, actually not. That was well, was a good explanation. So uh, it is a bit. I think I, I personally find it a bit easier in Nine if I just append things and end up with a usually end up with a column with a sorry with a table with a lot of columns. Um, but also to half answer Daniel's question um, about showing an image together with its splitted version. Um, so you can select the append option and then you will basically the results will be added in, in new columns. You'll end up with a pretty wide table, um, but it's good to, to have an overview. Yeah, that was it. Okay. Yes, <laughs> thanks. Um, yeah, maybe to also to mention, so of course, there's also ways to avoid that you um, duplicate and multiply your, your amount of data. Uh, so these are maybe a bit more advanced topics. And also maybe I should quickly mention uh, that a very useful thing for at least when you work with images, uh, if you go to the preferences in NIME and general, you can select show heap status. And if you apply that, uh, you will see uh, the amount of memory used by NIME currently in the, in the status bar at the very bottom. And I have to say that the memory management of NIME is really very, very good. So you, usually you don't have to care about um, having enough uh, computer memory available because the node outputs, when, it, when, when they don't fit into memory, they are basically written, uh, swapped out to disk uh, in, in the background. So there's nothing you have to care about usually. Um, all right, so um, we're close to the end of what I wanted to do today. So uh, we have created the, the single segments here. Um, there are ways uh, to actually improve the result. For example, uh, in here, you see that some of the labeling still have holes because in the raw data, uh, we had low intensities here in the nucleoli or whatever it is. Um, so in the in, inside the nucleus, nuclei, we could also, uh, for example, add a fill holes morphological operation. Um, we can do so. This one, if you if you click on the on the node and read the description, it says fill black holes in binary images. So the place to add this would actually after the global threshold and before the connected component analysis. So we can do this right here. Um, I just confirm the three messages here and re-execute the connected component analysis right away. It will execute fill holes and connected component analysis. And you see that now we end up with uh, segments without the holes. Similar, uh, sorry, I will open this one again. Uh, similarly, you might want to get rid of very small segments. This one, uh, like these two here. Um, so this we can do on several ways, but uh, the may, maybe the easiest here is a labeling filter. Labeling filter. We can, yeah, if you want to, to, to test it, I would leave that to you to find uh, to to play around with this. For now, uh, to to end this, I would like to show how we can do a simple measurement on the cells. So now we only have the the segments in inside the table, and I basically lost the the raw data 
already right after the column rename here. So the Gaussian convolution I selected to do only on the last channel. While in this node output, we still have our three channels. So if I want to go back and get these data in and join it with the, with the segmentation results, uh, there's a node for it as well. And this is one of the most used nodes when, when manipulating data in general, uh, the joiner node. Um, this one allows you to join two tables. I'll drag it here. So from two input ports, I'll double click to make this a little bit bigger. And now I can choose the table I want to have from the input images and the table I want to have from the connected component analysis. Now, of course, it, so if you look at the, at the error message here, it tells you, please define at least one joining method. Um, if I configure this node, I need to set, set something, some criteria to join um, these two tables together. Maybe let's switch here. <clears throat> so the joiner allows you to, to join any two tables together. Of course, these tables can contain the same number of rows in case you have unique identifiers for them. It's uh, quite easy. You can just put them next to each other. But uh, you might also join, want to join uh, several uh, well, different amounts of data to each other. So basically, if you have a large table with 1,000 rows and um, um, a small table defining your plate setup and the given, uh, given chemicals that you have added, for example, then you might join the corresponding correct line of this second table to each line of the first table. So that's uh, basically how, how that works. There's uh, some illustrations here. For example, in, in, in the left, well, this is a, a, a different non-image related topic here where you want to join columns of data and basically you join uh, by the same criterion. The customer key here is a unique number and you can join them together. Or you can join even on multiple criteria um, on, on, different, on different columns. And there's also different joining options. Uh, I will probably not detail this now. We can also talk about that uh, if necessary in the next, next week's seminar. So for now, I will just add a matching criterion. And by default, this one um, defaults to a row ID for both tables. I could also select any of these, uh, any of the columns that are in the tables, but in our case, uh, the, the row ID is actually what we want. Uh, because if you look carefully at the at the input table, I'll just open this one. So this one contains row zero, row one, row two. It can contain actually any string value, but um, the the unique property of this row ID is that they are really always unique uh, values and they are enforced to be unique. So we keep these row IDs in the connected component analysis table. We always have them in front of each table in our workflow. So we can use these row IDs to join together the, the two tables. So to the left table and the right table or the top input and the bottom input. And in the column selection tab, you see now for the top table, I can choose which columns to include and for the bottom likewise. In our case, we can leave it on the default options to just always include all columns. We do that, execute, and in our joint table, we now have the images together with the, with the segmentation. So maybe I take this opportunity to hand back to Stefan. So I would like to now share what I've done. And in, well, I will also show you to um, how to reset the workflow, because that's usually uh, when you want to save a workflow that you've worked on, um, you, it's, it's a good idea with image, images especially to reset the workflow first um, it, and confirm this reset so that all the nodes are in the unexecuted state and don't contain any data. Because if you 
save your uh, the workflow with all the images processed. It basically saves a copy of all the output outputs of all the nodes, which can be quite uh, a lot on, on, on your disk. But of course, while working on a workflow, you can do that. For sharing, I chose to reset the workflow and then save. And now I can use Nime Hub. So I need to first double click to uh, be redirected to the login page. Sorry for that. Oh, why am I not? Oh, sorry, I think I'm already in, yes. So you, if you have a Nime Hub uh, login, you can just uh, connect to the Nime Hub here and share your data with publicly with others or also store data privately in a, in a private workspace on the Nime Hub up to a certain extent of data. So now I would take my public space and I have a work, I created this morning a workflow group, Nubias Academy. And I will move my workflow into Nubias Academy here. And depending on the size of the workflow, it takes a little while to upload and it appears here in the Nime Hub. We can also, uh, maybe Stefan didn't mention it yet, I think uh, you have the Nime Hub tab here. Okay, that's funny. Now it's it crashed my name by clicking on it. Um, anyhow, that might be a, a Mac specific problem now or related to my screen setup. Um, you can also go with the browser to hub.nime.com. And if I now look for new BS, I should already find the, the workflow I uploaded immediately on the first position because there's not so many new BS keywords on the hub yet. And I can give a uh, hand over to, to Stefan this URL and he can basically, I will stop sharing my screen and I will let Stefan continue unless there's uh, burning questions right now, but I think we can wrap up in a few minutes. I don't think there's super urgent questions at the moment. Thank you very much, Jan. Um, I'm hopefully already sharing my screen and I already found the workflow um, that, you, that you just uploaded. And that actually gives me the opportunity to show you a, a I think, pretty cool feature is that I can really go in and first of all, on Nime Hub, you can, you can see a preview and um, get a lot of information about this workflow. But what I actually want to show you is I can take this URL up here do command C, copy this, and really select a folder in here in my workspace, say command V for pasting. And I can actually it will immediately download this in the background and allows me to import um, this workflow here. Can open it up and move it around. For a second, let's close it first, move it into the workflows folder, and then we can open it up again. And now I actually have the chance, let's see if it works. So let's execute here. Uh, you might have, I think I had the workflow one folder up actually. So yeah. the, the relative path is actually wrong. Mm, that is interesting. So, if you move it to the session one folder, it's actually good. I, I had the wrong folder. Good, then let's close it and we'll move it to the session one folder. Let me open it up again. Okay, now it finds the files and I can actually go in and execute this um, entire workflow here. Um, so there's one question that I, sorry about that. I actually said I would answer that live. Um, if there's any meaning in the crossing of the branches here. Um, in this particular case for a joiner, there is semantics attached to top node and uh, sort of to top port and bottom port. Um, so it matters how you connect it, but the crossing in general is just the visual thing uh, thing doesn't really um, matter for the for the execution. 
Um, what I want to show you now is a bit um, a couple of words around best practices and documentation of workflows because that's actually super important. And there's a couple of things that we can't change about nodes and workflows. That is our the notes sorry the names um, of nodes. They are fixed. You can't change those. But you see that as you add nodes and that below here you'll find what we call a label and you can actually change the labels in here. You can double click and um, load all images space from folder X, for instance. So that's one thing how you can document you can really assign labels um, to, to notes. And the second thing is, and as you browse through examples on Hub, for instance, also you'll notice that we have this concept of, an, of what we call a workflow annotation. And you can right click anywhere, open the context menu on the canvas, say new workflow, um, annotation, it will add that and it basically adds this workflow annotation. Let's move it over here. Basically adds this annotation um, behind behind the nodes. We're currently in editing modes. That was, that's where the nodes are grayed out. So we'll click somewhere here and you'll see um, this annotation actually is be behind the nodes. And you can also use this to document nodes in here. Uh, that's a bit boring already. You can edit that, um, you can change the, the color of the borders, for instance, if you want to show multiple parts and highlight multiple parts in your workflow, but you can also add um, descriptive text in here, like this is the, the segmentation part. Um, you can make things bold, change font sizes and so on. And this will also be saved together with the workflow. So best practice, keep that in mind, always document yourself others, but also your future self will thank you for it. Um, so that's uh, the one side of thing. And the second side of things that I wanted to mention is I briefly at the very beginning mentioned components and that you're actually able to, um, well, hide complexity and encapsulate complexity and nodes into components that again themselves behave like regular nodes. That's what I briefly want to show you. So for instance here, let's select the nodes that are actually involved in the segmentation. We can select all of them and do right click here and say create component. Um, yes, the nodes will be reset. That is perfectly fine. I can define a name, segmentation. And we'll actually see that this looks again like a node itself it has an input port, output port name. I can set a label um, and so on. I can actually, if you, if you want to, this is not fixed or anything. You can go in, open a component, open, and in a new window, it actually, uh, zoom in again a bit, it actually opens up this component. You can take a look again at the, the sub workflow at the nodes that we've wrapped to, that we've wrapped together. The nice thing, or one additional nice thing is, so first, you can keep your workflows clean. Um, the second thing, however, also is that you can share components. So I can actually share them with myself in my local workspace. I can, however, also, if I log into the Nime Hub, opens in a different screen, the second I will be logged in. So now I can actually say component. I want to share this component to Nime Hub, to my public space, for instance. And then you will actually be able to find this image segmentation once the upload is finished. You can go to hub.nime.com, find the image segmentation um, component on there, and really from the hub, drag and drop it into, um, into your workflows and reuse it um, in your own workflows. Let's see if I can, I can find it in here. Ah, there we go. Don't see my screen, I'm very aware of that. So there's a image segmentation down here. That's a component. You can add descriptions here as well. If I make that a bit smaller, you can actually do this. You can really, there's a note back in here. You can take that drag and drop that and reuse that in your workflows as well. And the beauty of that is it keeps the connection to the version on the hub. Whenever I do an update and change things, fix some things in there, you 
can also apply that update, but you could also say, well, I don't want um, those updates anymore, or I want to do um, my own changes. They are now read only basically. You can go in and say, okay, I want to disconnect the link. And now you can change the component um, yourself again. So the idea really is that components are functionality um, that you can also reuse. We provide components um, ourselves, um, but you can also build components, share them with yourself, reuse the, the functionality there. And that I think actually allows me to jump the couple of slides and come to a short conclusion. I and mean, we do have this session next week, um, but, but allow me um, an intermediate uh, conclusion here. So really, nine image processing allows you to build um, image analysis pipelines built from images until statistics and visualization, and we'll cover that part about data analysis um, next week. And it's actually quite nice because the workflow itself is kind of self-documenting. You can take a look, you see the um, how the data flows um, in it, and being able to also see intermediate results is actually quite nice um, while you're building out workflows, and it makes debugging um, a, a lot easier, to be honest. Um, if you've taken care of building a workflow um, properly, you can actually really say, I built it on one data file, for instance, build out my, my workflow, and then just feed a couple of images to the analysis workflow, and it will process all the images um, in a batch fashion. And I think the, the nice thing here really is that's an interesting aspect, and it's same thing holds true for um, recording image gem macros, whatever you're doing to be able to reproduce things and move towards reproducible science. And so the idea really is that a workflow uh, is basically, it is a script in a sense, it defines a pipeline and we, we make very sure that a workflow yields the same results when you apply it to the same data, even if you have updated nine in between. Um, so that's the intermediate conclusion for now. Um, Jan, feel free to, um, to jump in. If not, I would go ahead briefly um, talk about the, the assignment until next week. It's really optional, um, feel free to do it. Um, it will be discussed at the, at the next session. Um, we do have um, an entire workflow group that is a workflow that you can start with that we've called assignment, but also the data that is required to do the assignment that hides behind um, this link here that should actually Maybe someone from the moderators can put that um, into the chat as well. You can download it. It is an NAR file, K-N-A-R, it's a NIME archive. You can import it into NIME, take the file, drag and drop it into your Explorer or go the manual route as a file, import NIME workflow. Or if you have a NIME hub account already, you can do as I did before and copy and paste the following URL and just paste the URL into your local workspace and that will automatically um, download the, the assignment. So what is the assignment about? You will find detailed instructions in the workflow um, step by step what you're supposed to do. Um, so the idea is that there is that we have um, images, two channel images, um, multiple images in one in the data folder basically here the idea is to open all the images, segment them, according to the first channel, clean up the, um, the segmentation results with a couple of notes that you've seen today that Jan has shown, but also feel free to explore yourself um, what is available, hint, hint, Nime Hub, um, and also um, use the segmentation masks to extract the, the size, the area of cells, but also the average, the mean intensity from the second channel for each image in each file. Two channel images, first step, identify cells, and then measure the intensity in the, in the second channel. We'll come back to this and discuss that, take that as a starting point for the session next week. Uh, I think that was it for now. There are maybe a couple of questions in the Q&A that we can briefly maybe take a minute or two to answer or 
we were running yes, over also time. that would maybe provide a nice outlook for the things that we also show next week yes. um do we still have a few minutes yes please okay. go ahead so uh, i think Stefan, you had seen the question already um about using stardist or any other um, deep learning method and it's uh, replacing the current segmentation by this one yeah so, so the the nice thing about that if, if i may um really is that the component that i've just built i've wrapped the segmentation into one component basically the beauty of that is i can easily replace this component with another component or with another set of nodes basically so let's say there were a stardust component that you could reuse or maybe a cell post component for example and you can really just drag and drop that onto the segmentation component that we've just built and it replaces the um the current implementation so it's really it's actually amazing how fast you can iterate and um try out different um, segmentation algorithms um for instance and that is actually something that we'll talk about next week yes and maybe if i may add uh for the answer to another question uh, so uh, during do you need to install use programs on your computer like image j that uh, that is used by naim and of course if you share workflow you want to make sure it's reproducible so that is dependent a bit on uh, on what tool you're using so in case of image j um, there is a built-in version of image j with the image uh, image j integration in naim that provides the basic functionality but if you point uh, this point this integration to your local fiji installation to also use other plugins which you can do then of course you have to make sure that the uh, whoever uh, uses your workflow also has these plugins installed and does the same thing so this is a little bit of um, something to, 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 to take care of manually you know, on the other hand for example for the uh, existing python integration um, this is yeah if there there's uh, now nodes that actually allow you to to take the same conda environment and uh, define it in your workflow so that whoever receives and uses your workflow uh, uses the same conda environment and that's very handy in my opinion to have maybe stefan you want to add something i well there i mean it's the same story for python and r or any other external integration we, we try to uh, not for let's pick python as an example we we, have, we, have, we don't use a re-implementation of python like jython for instance um but you actually the if, since we are using a local installation of python on your machine yes that means you have to install python but that also means that you can use all the libraries um i don't know second learn second image if you for instance wanted to um you can use all those libraries as you'd use them in a Jupyter notebook for instance or in a regular um, python script so there's no limitations around that same thing holds true for r but yes the reprodu reproducibility there it's a bit harder to make sure um that others have the same execution um environment basically um, I think we answered that one live. Um, recommended way of doing version control for workflows. Um, if you share work, when you share workflows on Nime Hub, um, you can actually um, create, you'll be asked if you want to overwrite um, the version or if you want to create a snapshot from that. But in general, that is something um, that is less Nime Analytics platform and more Nime servers slash Nime Hub related because the Nime server also, for instance, it's a, it's a central um, installation of Nime that you can also use as a repository, basically. And there you can also create so called snapshots, which are basically versions um, of workflows. Maybe and just to add to, to that, I've seen uh, some people who are uh, at ease with Git uh, to just use uh, Git to work to manage their workflow repository. So basically, the work, the, the the folder that contains your workflows on your on your local disk, and you can put some ignore rules for the data, for example. So that works more or less, but of course, it's um, you don't easily see the the diff between two versions in this case. Um, Nime is, itself has a has a diff feature for different workflow versions, but that is also more related to the to the server and hub functionality again. Yes. Good, and then feedback microscopy. Very interesting question. Don't will not go into details. 
Uh, if you Google for NIME and Zila, S-I-L-A, Zila is a standard for lab automation. We just, I and Johnny, a colleague of mine, who worked together with uh, the folks that um, built the Zila standard for lab automation. We built a prototype in NIME that actually allows you to get images from a uh, microscope, for instance, but also send back result to a Zila supported um, device, also microscope, plate reader, whatever. We published a blog post about that in January, so that should be easily findable. Just Google or use your favorite search engine, Zila and NIME. Um, you can read, read up on that. Great, and I would say uh, we would uh, collect the questions anyhow and uh, put the Q and A's on the Image SC forum after the next week's seminar. So we'll still collect more questions next week. Good, yes. then it looks like we are on an end. Thanks a lot, it was very, very interactive, very nice, very nice features. And uh, please fill out the survey that uh, Rocco sent around. And yeah, as Jan said, there will be the question and answers uploaded and also the recording of the video at some point on the YouTube channel of New Bias. So yeah, thanks a lot. See you soon to a new webinar. And Jan and Stefan, if you stay a bit longer, that would be great. Certainly. Stay safe, everyone. It was a pleasure. Bye -bye. <laughs>